Thank you so much, Tanya. And I did want to acknowledge Tanya for all of her hard work in organizing the three seminars. We're really appreciative of your work. <laughs> and as well, acknowledge our public realm committee, our advisory committee, because they were also instrumental in organizing these sessions. Um, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Edith George, and I have had the opportunity to hear Edith speak at the Thornhill Garden Horticultural Meeting, so you're in for a real treat. And I just wanted to give you a little background. Edith has been an advisor to the nonprofit Ontario Urban Forest Council, established 1963, for over 10 years. She is a former director of the board of the Weston Historical Society. She is quick to admit her passion for heritage trees and travels the province of Ontario answering the questions, what is a heritage tree? Why should they be protected? She uses her neighborhood's great red oak and tells its story. She is an online columnist for Metroland Media Group. Her column is titled Natural Roots and is about the various significant trees found in the city where she was born and lives in Toronto. So I will introduce Ben Caesar as well. And Ben Caesar uh, was born and raised in Elmira, Ontario. He learned of permaculture and forest gardening through a friend and got hooked immediately. He has been experimenting with perennial ed edibles for many years and opened Fiddlehead Nursery in 2012. He manages and eats from an ever-expanding demonstration garden to showcase some of the best plants for edible landscapes. He is passionate about gardens that mimic the diversity and structure of natural ecosystems as they build soil and produce food. So if you could join me in welcoming our two speakers today. Thank you. I find, it, I find it very appropriate that I'm in the Canada room because this is Canada's 150 and I'm going to be telling a story. I'm going to be telling the story of a tree whose roots and branches are intertwined in the history of our country and the presentation is called Heritage Tree, Preserving Our Natural Roots. In the neighborhood where I live, which was once called Rivermead, stands two red oaks. And also this house, which is called Rivermead, and it's on the proposed heritage property list of the city of Toronto. The Ontario Urban Forest Council produced a toolkit to assist individuals or groups such as historical societies, schools, churches, or whomever feel there's a special tree in their area that should be considered a heritage tree. And this toolkit has all the documents you require to prove that that is a heritage tree. Some of the documents inside of it are evaluation forms for windrow trees, a pair of trees, a grove of trees, or a single tree. This is the evaluation form for a single tree. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate for you today one of the red oaks that's in my neighborhood, the Nicholas family's red oak. You're going to see how it fared on its evaluation, and you'll see photographs of this tree afterwards. There are five categories and 10 charts, two charts per category. The first category I want to talk to you about is rarity. Is it rare to find the species red oak growing in the city of Toronto? It's not. It's an indigenous species to my city. So the tree ended up with a two out of four. Is it rare to find the species red oak growing on planet Earth? It's not. It's a common species to our planet. And the tree ended up with another two out of four. Now, I was not happy with this evaluation that the experts gave this tree. But then I really thought about it and I realized something. This is a good thing. This is a tree species that's going to be able to handle climate change. The next category is prominence. The DBH, the diameter at breast height of this tree. Is it of the highest percentage for the species red oak? Yes, it is. Four out of four. The age of this tree relative to human settlement of the land. 
The land was settled in 1848. All the experts agree this tree started its life pre-settlement of the land four out of four. Integrity. Experts went and they examined this tree. They couldn't find root rot on its roots, cankers on its stem. There was no infestation of insects in its canopy. There were no visual problems with this plant. Four out of four. Is it going to live another 30 years? Yes, it is. Another four out of four. The appearance of this tree. Would a professional photographer wish to take a photograph of this tree? Would a professional artist wish to paint a picture of this tree? Is this tree striking to look at? Yes, it is. Four out of four. The form of the tree for the species red oak. Is this tree majestic? Yes, it is. Four out of four. The top category for heritage status, and it's my forte, my passion, is the social. And it's split into two charts. Historically, is this tree of international or national importance? Yes, it is. Four out of four. Culturally, is this tree of international or national importance? Yes, it is. Another four out of four. The Nicholas family's red oak ended up with a 97.5% out of 100. That's what it looked like in 1961 when a man by the name of Michael William Nicholas came to buy a brand new house in a brand new subdivision. And where he was looking to purchase, only two houses had been built and they were built side by side and there were no other houses in the area. He chose this house because he wanted to own that tree that lived in its backyard. But I want you to, folks to think about this. It's 1961 and you're a developer. The first thing you're going to say to your workman is you see that tree, cut it down, get rid of the roots, build the house. No one touched that tree because they knew it was a very important tree. Now this is what it looks like today in the springtime. In the summer, in the fall, and in the winter. It's a beautiful four season tree that graces my neighborhood. And it's a privately owned tree. I'm going to show you what you cannot see from the road. The circumference was measured on August 23, 2006 by three experts at 16 feet, 4 inches. And the tree is still growing. Other than cutting that tree down and counting the rings, then we'd know exactly how old the tree is. The age varies between the experts. One expert says it's 250 years old. Another one says it's 300. Yet another says it's 350, and the arborist that had been taking care of this tree since 1996, he feels it's 400 years old. So I'm always safe to say that this tree is over 250 years old. The CBC News felt that the issue of preserving heritage trees is so important that they aired this segment. In most Toronto neighborhoods, all you have to do to see some history is look out your window. The city is full of magnificent trees that have been standing for generations. Perlita Stroh shows us one historic tree tonight and the two women who want to make sure it'll stand for generations to come. Arlene Doan and Edith George are longtime neighbors. They've become friends over their shared love of a tree. It isn't just any tree though. This red oak is one of Canada's oldest at around 250 years old. It's also one of its largest at over 25 meters tall. My hope is that it will stay here indefinitely. The tree has been a part of Doan's family all her life. Her dad bought this house in 1961, and she says he spent much of his time looking after the tree. One day he came out to show some people the house that he bought, and there was a bulldozer there, and they're going to take the tree down. And my father said no to the workman. I bought this because of the tree. After he died, Doan took over caring for the tree, spending thousands on its upkeep. And now she's trying to ensure that no one can ever cut it down by having it declared a heritage site. 
This is where her new friend Edith George comes in. She's with the area's historical society. It's important because this tree specifically is an indigenous species of the Humber River watershed. In fact, the tree was once part of the Carrying Place Trail, a historic native portage route. The City of Toronto currently does have a bylaw to protect privately owned trees, but it allows people to apply for permits to have them removed. This new plan would designate trees as heritage sites and ensure that no one could ever have them torn down. When I saw the main stem on it, I was just amazed because it was well over five feet through and it had, the whole tree had so much character and life to it. Jack Radecki started a steering committee to nominate trees around the city that he thinks should be permanently protected. If passed, the bylaw would be a first for Toronto. For Arlene Doan, that would make all her efforts worthwhile. It's oxygen, it's life, it's, it's the best thing that we can have. Perlita Stroh, CBC News, Toronto. Historically, why is this tree of international importance? In green foliage is the St. Lucie tree, in red is the Nicholas family's tree, and that's the house still standing called Rivermead. The Toronto Region and Conservation Authority made up a map of the Humber River watershed. And in a few seconds, you're going to see a small part of that map. That purple broken line that's going down, that's the historic Toronto Carrying Place Trail. The First Nations of North America used the Aboriginal Highway as part of the trade route that connected Northern and Western Canada with the Gulf of Mexico. With the coming of the Europeans, Explorers, missionaries, and map makers use this trail. Men such as Etienne Brule, Father Jean de Brebeuf, and Lieutenant Governor John Grave Simcoe walk this path. The St. Lucie tree and the Nicholas family's tree were markers for the historic Toronto Carrying Place Trail. Update July 3, 2013 where the St. Lucie tree is located, we call it the ridge. The owner, our local barber, had one of his customers go in his backyard with a metal detector. He found all kinds of metal objects. He found a hand-hewn horseshoe and he found a button. So he cleaned the button up, he researched it, circa 1812 British Army. Who kept watch over the Nicholas family's red oak? Culturally, why is this tree of international importance? What were their family's contributions to Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and the world? We start with the first settlers of the land. The Irish, they came from County Cabin, Ireland. Three brothers and a brother-in-law. Now, it was Matthew Griffith who was the brother who owned the land where these trees could be found. But his older brother, Thomas Griffith, joined the Loyalists in the Mackenzie Rebellion of 1837, and their brother-in-law, Abraham Welsh, he was jailed by the rebels in that same rebellion. Eventually, the land was sold to this couple, Percy and Gertrude Gardner, and it became their country estate called Rivermead from 1933 to 1950. They put service to the community first. Their volunteer philanthropy lives on in their descendants. And my hair went up the back of my neck when I came in here because Percy Gardner was a very close friend of the Right Honorable Arthur Meehan. And Arthur Meehan once lauded him at a big uh, committee meeting saying, this Percy Gardner, I would be remiss to not say that he was a great Canadian. They had a son, daughter, son-in-law, and daughter-in-law. All four of them became members of the Order of Canada. Now, in 1960, the land northwest was zoned residential. And the following year, this man came to buy a brand new house in a brand new subdivision. His name was Michael William Nicholas, and he was a career airman. During his service to our country, he was stationed just outside of Naples, Italy, during World War II, and in Japan for the Korean airlift. But in 1961, he bought a house 
because he wanted to own the tree that lived in its backyard. And in that year, this man was a visionary. When the words environment, preservation, conservation were not in the average person's vocabulary, these words were in his vocabulary. And that tree was in dire straits. He changed the weeping tiles, the underground drainage, so more water could get to the roots of the tree. He talked to tree experts. He'd go to the local bookmobile. He'd get books on trees. The property ended up being sold, and this is the last owner, to his daughter, Arlene Doan. She has two sons. Interesting last name, Doan. I wonder if her son's ancestors contributed anything to Canada. Well, one of their ancestors was a true Canadian rebel, and his name was Charles Doan. He joined the rebels, marching down Young Street in the Mackenzie Rebellion of 1837. So this is what you have, folks. You have the original settlers of the land, family members joining the Loyalists, in the Mackenzie Rebellion of 1837, and one of the last owners of one of the trees, family members joining the rebels in that same rebellion. And the loyalists, they marched north on Young, and the rebels marched south, and they eventually did clash. On a really, on Saturday, December 21, 2013, the city of Toronto we had the worst ice storm in our history. So Monday morning, I grabbed my camera to walk around the corner to see how the Nicholas family's red oak had fared. As an, and as I'm walking, I'm actually seeing neighbors and friends with chainsaws, and they're cutting their trees that are ready to go right into the roofs of their homes, or tree branches that are gonna go, and they're going to go right into the windows of their properties. And then I saw the great red oak. And Arlene Doan, always has a brand new Canadian flag at her front door in memory of her dad and his service to our country. This tree had survived that storm. There wasn't one twig, one branch off this tree. <coughs> if these trees could talk, the stories that they could tell about the countries where they live, they've survived the toxins in the air, water, and soil. Their seeds can be used to propagate their species, and they give us hope for a planet that's dying and truly have earned the right to live. On a very hot summer's day, Friday of August 12th of last year, the tree on the ridge had to be cut down. It was decided it was a hazard tree. So I'm going to read you this Portuguese tree poem. And it's been used in Portuguese tree preservation for more than 1,000 years. Prayer of the Woods. I am the heat of your hearth on the cold winter nights, the friendly shade screening you from the summer sun. And my fruits are refreshing drafts quenching your thirst as you journey on. I am the beam that holds your house, the board of your table, the bed on which you lie, and the timber that builds your boat. I am the handle of your hoe, the door of your homestead, the wood of your cradle, and the shell of your coffin. I am the bread of kindness and the flower of beauty. Ye who pass by, listen to my prayer, harm me not. So what were we going to do with this wood other than burning it? The 12th Division, CPLC, in Toronto got together and started a grassroots movement. This is one of our volunteers, who's a master carver, Trevor Coomer. Uh, this gentleman, Jack, is from Toronto Sun. This is Martin from CBC News. And we are going to be celebrating Canada's 150 by carving this wood and having various pieces put in our, uh, in our community. Also, we have the um, uh, Toronto Blue Jays involved because it's their 40th anniversary and Percy Gardner owned at one time, he was a real sportsman, he owned the Toronto Maple Leafs baseball team. Also, we have the Toronto Argos involved, Rhea Carving, because one of the other families that owned this property, the Krangs, they built Oakwood Stadium in Toronto and the Argonauts practiced there and they did have a few games there. Now, folks, 
trust me, please come to this free event. I'll be speaking for about 20 minutes and, and um, Peter uh, Winichuk, the Executive Director of the Ontario Urban Forest Council, will be speaking about uh, policies, how to recognize heritage trees, what's the difference between rec recognition and designation, and it's free. There'll be a, a walk afterwards at noon in the uh, Acropolis Cemetery, and you have to go to event Eventbrite at Cabbage Town Relief to get your, um, your ticket. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Ben Caesar. I run Fiddle Ed Nursery up in the Beaver Valley near Kimberley, sort of in the Collingwood area. Um, and I do forest gardening or edible landscaping. Um, I first heard about this in 2003, I moved to Guelph and met a guy whose dad worked with my dad and uh, he called me out of the blue one day. He said, hey, I heard you moved to Guelph. I had heard of him through my dad, and, uh, and he said, I'm, I'm gonna go plant a field of nut trees. Would you like to come help? I was like, oh, that sounds really interesting. I had no experience in, uh, in agriculture or gardening at the time, and, uh, and I went and helped him plant this field of nut trees, and he told me about permaculture and, uh, and edible landscaping, and uh, I was fascinated by the, uh, by the concept, and, uh, and so he lent me a few books, and I started reading about it. And I read more and more, and then I, I started planting an edible landscape in my yard in Guelph and uh, filled it up pretty quickly. And then I, uh, I wanted more land to experiment with. And, uh, and I found that uh, there weren't many sources for a lot of the plants that work well in edible landscapes in Ontario. So I moved up north and bought a farm and uh, started my nursery. And, um, and so now every year I experiment with new plants and, uh, and design uh, new garden beds uh, that are edible as well as ornamental, and um, and so I'll uh, I'll get on with this. So what what is forest gardening? It's a it's a garden that mimics a young natural woodland. Um, it's it's three dimensional gardening, which means that you uh, you get products from uh, the the trees uh, in your canopy, the shrubs in the shrub layer, and the the ground cover layer provides salad greens and perennial vegetables. Um, the, your products can include food, but uh, as well as medicinals and building materials. Um, and if you have enough land, you can produce firewood. Uh, you can, some plants produce soap and fibers. Um, so there's a number of different products you can get. Uh, fertility is designed into the system, and uh, it uh, minimizes competition, maximizes cooperation, and uh, and there's a heavy focus on multi-purpose plants. So. If a plant uh, fixes nitrogen and fertilizes the plants around it and then also provides an edible product, then that's a great uh, candidate for a forest garden. So it's obviously anytime you're growing food in your own yard, it's the most local food available. Uh, it promotes a healthy and diverse diet. Um, the third point here, uh, it's, it's resistant to climactic extremes, is a huge one for me. These gardens are much more resilient than uh, annual vegetable gardens. If you set up, it takes a lot of work to set up and design an edible landscape, but once it's set up, then over the years it becomes less and less maintenance and more and more bountiful. So uh, if you come under an economic shock, if there are climactic extremes, then these gardens keep on producing food. So they're very resilient gardens and um, I grow annual vegetables too. I love my annual vegetable bed, uh, but um, but so so these provide an excellent complement to uh, to annual vegetables. They're, they're very low maintenance once they're set up, and they sequester carbon in the soil. Um, so um, so it makes for a more resilient and self-sufficient gardener. Um, so I'll talk a bit about fertility. How do you make a garden self-fertile? Well, there, there's a few strategies. Uh, using nitrogen fixing plants is, is uh, one of the main strategies. So nitrogen is, uh, is, is very heavily used by cropping plants. Um, and you can incorporate nitrogen fixing species into your garden so that you don't have to import nitrogen. Um, so uh, an example is um, uh, sea buckthorn. Uh, this is a, a popular uh, berry now in uh, the health food industry. Uh, they use it for skin creams, and it's very nutritious, very high in antioxidants, 
and sea buckthorn also um, uh, fixes nitrogen, so it'll fertilize the plants around it. This is not the same plant as buckthorn, which is an invasive exotic. Um, sea buckthorn is, uh, is um, uh, in the uh, Eliagnus family and um, is related to Russian olive and autumn olive. And, um, and they're, they're, uh, China produces about, they have about um, 100,000 acres under sea buckthorn production, and they don't export any. And so that tells you how important a crop it is in China. And so, um, so there are more and more people planting these crops, and uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderful plant to include in a forest garden. Um, potassium and phosphorus are supplied by mineral accumulators. So uh, a good example of that is comfrey. Comfrey is a deep-rooted perennial. The roots go down three or four meters, and uh, they draw minerals up from the subsoils into its leaves. And when the leaves decompose, they uh, deposit those minerals onto the surface of the soil, lending them to the crops around them. So I plant a comfrey plant next to every fruit tree that I plant, uh, next to berry bushes, and they will fertilize those plants for you. So um, it's a great way to keep nutrients within the cycle of your... Um, of your garden. Uh, you can also cut comfrey down uh, up to four times a year and it will grow up more. It's a very robust plant. Um, so, uh, and then you just put those leaves around the plants you want to fertilize. Um, and it, it also makes an excellent ground cover. It attracts beneficial insects and it can be used topically as a medicinal. So I sprained my ankle a few years back and I had heard that you can make a poultice with comfrey. So I was like, how do you make a poultice? So I googled it and you just throw a few leaves in a blender with some water and rub it onto your ankle, which I did, and it made the swelling go down. Um, it, was, it was quite remarkable. I should have sprained my other ankle as a, as a trial, but I, I didn't get around to it. Um, so, um, and then uh, mycorrhizal fungi play an important role as well. Um, in natural ecosystems, as well as perennial gardens, um, they move uh, moist uh, water and nutrients physically from areas of low fertility to areas of fi high fertility. So if you have uh, a black locust tree which fixes nitrogen on, uh, on one side of your garden and then an apple tree which, which requires a lot of nitrogen on the other side, the mycorrhizal fungi form extensive networks underground and um, will move the nitrogen physically from under the black locust to the apple tree in exchange for sugars that it receives from the apple tree. So it's a wonderful symbiotic relationship that's found all throughout nature which we can harness in a... Um, in a perennial edible garden. Um, so one way to introduce mycorrhizal fungi into your garden is to put a piece of cardboard uh, in a natural woodland near you and leave it down for about a month and then come back and take that cardboard and put it down in your garden. The, the fungi will inoculate the cardboard and then it will not inoculate your soil. You can also buy products, but it's not necessary. It will find its way into your garden if you uh, don't use fungicides and uh, if, you, if you allow your garden uh, to develop naturally. So one thing about perennial gardens is that you're not tilling the soil. Um, in annual agriculture, most systems we have uh, to keep the weeds down requires tilling. Anytime you till the soil, you're, you're breaking the bonds of, of carbon in the soil and releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Agriculture as we practice it today is, is one of the most destructive practices in the world. Um, and so if we can find an agriculture that maintains the surface soil and allows plants to, uh, to fill in the soil and build soil naturally as we provide food for each other, then that's an excellent way of mitigating climate change and of developing resilient systems. Um, so uh, a rule of thumb is you need about 25 to 30 percent of your total canopy area to be in nitrogen fixers. So that's a, that's a lot of area. And the heavy croppers, you, you need about 40 percent. So if you have apple trees, every third apple tree or so should be a nitrogen fixer, um, or every third tree within your system. Uh, but that can be likened to the practice in annual agriculture of uh, field rotation and allowing one field to go fallow and planting it in legumes and then tilling those under, which is an old, old practice in annual agriculture. So you're taking up the space, and if you can find nitrogen fixers that also provide an edible product, the, the black locust tree, uh, for example, pro provides excellent edible flowers in the spring. It's about a two-week period, so it's a short uh, harvesting season, but they're 
they're really delicious. They have a, a very faint uh, vanilla flavor. You can throw them in salads. You can cook with them. Uh, they're, they're excellent. Um, so wind protection is, uh, is, is essential in, in ag any agricultural system. Um, and so it makes sense, of course, to, to use edible windbreaks, uh, such as autumn olive or um, uh, the sea buckthorn. And, um, and then uh, nitrogen fixers uh, al also make a, a lot of sense. If, you're, if your windbreak is on, on the windward side, then the leaves falling off in the fall will, will be high in nitrogen. And so, um, so you're fertilizing your garden as you're providing wind protection. This slide's a little off. Uh, it's blocking some of the text. But um, attracting beneficial insects is really important in a garden, too. So I have a greenhouse. If I see an aphid explosion in my greenhouse, then I'll take a soapy water solution and spray down the, the little plants that are, that are vulnerable to aphids. But if I see an aphid explosion in my garden, I won't do anything. I'll monitor the situation, and, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll watch. And invariably, the uh, predator insect population will increase within a few days, and they'll take care of the aphids for me. Um, so pest insects are really a problem in monocultures. If you have a field of corn, and you have an insect that likes corn, of course your population is going to explode. But one of the great things about these gardens is that if designed properly, they're, they're highly diverse, and so you're never going to get a huge explosion in pests. Um, and uh, you want to ensure that pollen is available throughout the growing season. So you want flowers blooming uh, from May till October. And you want a large diversity of, of plants that attract beneficial insects in your garden so that you have a healthy balance uh, of insects in your garden. So I want some pests in my garden to feed the predators to keep the insect balance in check. And so I have, you know, uh, sorrel growing in my garden and it always gets a little bit holy, but I don't mind. I just wipe the pests off and in, eat my sorrel. So I'm happy to share as long as uh, the insects are in balance. Um, canopy design, um, it's, it's a good idea to, to include uh, well-known fruit trees these have been bred for centuries to be delicious, to be high yielding, uh, um, and so it's they're they're wonderful apples, tree uh, apples, plums, pears, cherries. I've planted all of these yesterday I, in my garden. I planted an apple tree, uh, a pear tree, and uh, three Korean pine nut trees. Um, so I I use these uh, these trees extensively in my gardens, but the downside is that they require high fertility. They require more maintenance uh, than the lesser known fruit and nut trees uh, because they've been bred to be so prolific that you need to learn how to prune them and, uh, and they, they just require a lot more fertility because they bear so heavily. If you, if you allow an apple tree to, uh, to, to just produce on its own, it can sometimes bear so heavily that it breaks its own branches. So you need to learn how to prune. It's, it's just more maintenance. And so it makes sense to include some lesser known trees as well. Mulberries are fantastic fruit-bearing trees. Um, they, uh, some, and some taste nicer than others. So if you've tried a mulberry and it hasn't been good, try another one. Uh, don't discount them, because some are, are really delicious. And you can throw a tarp under a ripe mulberry tree, shake the branches, and they'll fall into your tarp. And so you'll harvest a whole bunch at once. And then nut trees. We should be growing more nut trees. Nuts are an excellent product for a northern climate because they dry well and then they can be stored for years. Um, uh, we can easily grow black walnuts around here. That's an indigenous tree that provides an excellent walnut. Um, they're, um, they're a little tricky in a forest garden because they do sort of have this chemical warfare that they, uh, they, they, um, they have juglone, which is a chemical that suppresses certain other plants. But there are plants that g grow well under black walnuts, so it's, uh, it's something you have to be aware of. But there are other, other um, walnuts that work well around here. Carpathian walnuts are being grown in Ontario commercially now. Um, and then uh, Japanese walnuts, or heart nuts, uh, grow very well in Ontario. I have many planted on my property. And they take a long time to bear fruit, um, but, uh, but in time, uh, you'll have uh, like a heavy walnut pr production without really any work at all. Uh, so they're a, they're a marvelous nut tree. Hazelnuts, there's a growing Ontario hazelnut um, uh, commercial 
um, operation. Uh, like they're, they're becoming more and more planted in Ontario and they're an excellent choice for the forest garden as well um, because they're, they're very low maintenance and they, uh, they provide excellent and delicious nuts. Um, it's a good idea to use a scale map. Um, plant larger trees to the north uh, so that they don't shade the, the smaller trees. Um, space trees according to mature size. So if you're buying fruit trees, you need to know what kind of rootstock they're on. Uh, so apple trees can be on standard size, semi-dwarf or dwarf size rootstock. So whatever nursery you get your trees from should be able to tell you what rootstock they're on and how big they will get. So that's really important. It's, it's really easy to have two apple trees and plant them, you know, 12 feet apart and eventually they, they grow into each other and, uh, and get, it's, uh, they need to be spaced far enough apart so that a lot of air movement can, uh, can get through the trees to reduce disease. And, um, and so in a, in a forest garden situation, if you want lots of production from your understory, then you want to plant trees far, far enough apart that you get gaps between your canopy. So in fact, if you, if you think of a, a mature forest, uh, it can be very dark in the, uh, with a very closed canopy. So um, for a productive edible landscape, uh, you don't want that. Uh, you, want, you want lots of light to get to the lower layers. So you want 20 to 30 percent gaps between your canopy trees um, so that you can grow uh, productive berry bushes and productive perennial vegetables underneath. And then also fruit trees require pollination, um, cross-pollination. A lot of uh, apple trees, you, you need two different varieties uh, to get any fruit. Pear trees, same thing. Plum trees are particularly finicky. Uh, Japanese plums won't pollinate European plums and neither will pol pollinate American plums. So you have to uh, be careful uh, as to which plums you're getting. Um, so, and the shrubs, you fit them in where the light is. Uh, so some shrubs are quite productive in quite a deep shade. The red and white currants produce quite well in uh, you know, three-quarter shade. Uh, there's aronia berries or choke berries. These produce quite well in the shade. But then a lot of shrubs produce better in full sun. So uh, a lot of the black currants, the gooseberries, um, these are shrubs that aren't planted a lot, and they should be more because um, you know, uh, I don't plant blueberries on my place because I'm on the escarpment. It's, uh, the base is limestone, so it's alkaline soils. So you can't grow blueberries without importing soil um, uh, to make it more acidic. But gooseberries are delicious. If you've had a fresh gooseberry off a, off a gooseberry bush, there's, there's no better fruit in the world, in my opinion. Uh, so, so seek out gooseberries. Um, and then black currants make one of the best jams in the world. Um, Saskatoons are a native shrub, and they're, they're really equally delicious. They're, they're, they're a lovely shrub. Um, and then again, watch for pollination requirements. A lot of shrubs are self-fertile, but they will bear more heavily with another variety nearby. Um, so just be aware of that. Ground covers, I'm passionate about ground covers. This is the key to low maintenance gardens. And if you can find a ground cover that's also edible, then that's an excellent candidate for a forest garden. Um, you can mix running ground covers with clumping ground covers. Um, I have some... Uh, some examples here. This is, uh, this is chocolate mint, uh, a running ground cover. It, it forms a, a really excellent ground cover underneath your shrubs and trees. Um, some people hate mint because it takes over a garden pretty quickly. But uh, I bury uh, rhizome barriers or root barriers in the ground around my mint patches. So I just go to Home Depot. I buy a roll of aluminum flashing one foot wide. I bury it in my garden. It's a lot of work to put it in, but once it's in, you have a, a thriving patch of mint that, that will never spread. Um, so that's one way to control running ground covers. And then clumping ground covers, rhubarb is an excellent example of a, a great clumping rhubarb. If you plant your rhubarb plants two and a half feet apart, they, their leaves will overlap and uh, they won't allow weeds to grow up and, and they'll keep the moisture in. That's, these are the two main functions that ground covers perform, which is the same as mulch. If you mulch your gardens, you're trying to keep weeds down and keep the moisture in. Ground covers do the same thing, but they replenish the nutrients in the soil at the same time. So they're very important in, uh, in low maintenance ecological gardens. Um, sorrel is an excellent clumping ground cover. Sorrel gets to be about one foot wide and, and one foot tall. It has a t 
tart, lemony flavor. I use sorrel every day. I eat it in sandwiches. I make, I, I put it in salads. It's delicious. And uh, and if you plant sorrel uh, about eight inches apart, then you have a ground cover that will never spread, and uh, and that you can eat. So it's it's lovely. Um, uh, yeah, perennial vegetables. Yeah, this is Egyptian walking onion. Uh, it grows these bulbs at the top of the stalks, and uh, the bulbs get bigger and bigger until the stalk falls over, and then they grow from there, so they walk around your garden. And uh, they're one of the first greens to come up in the spring, um, and they're an excellent spicy green onion, so you can use them in salads, you can use them in soups, uh, and then you can also eat the bulbs. At this stage in the photo, uh, the bulbs are still green, so you don't have to peel them. Um, and you can just cut them in half and fry them up like onions. They're very easy uh, to use as a perennial onion. Um, later on in their life, they develop a papery husk, and they be become pretty fiddly, and I don't bother with them at that point. But you can dig up the bulbs underground, which are bigger perennial onions uh, to use in your kitchen. So um, This is Good King Henry. It was popular among the Romans as a potter, so the, the young shoots, you boil them uh, for just a few minutes, and they make a, a good... Uh, a good cooked green. This is also, it, they're related to amaranth and uh, they produce loads of seeds which you can use as a grain. So it's a perennial grain crop. I, uh, I always harvest these. It's very easy to harvest. You just hold a, ball, uh, a bowl under the seed heads and, and strip them off and then boil them like oatmeal. So it's a, it's a great perennial oatmeal. Um, this is pokeweed. Uh, one of the best poisonous edible plants out there. Uh, it's um, <laughs> it's Every part of the plant is toxic, but the, the young shoots in the spring, you cut them and boil them in two changes of water, and they're delicious. It's one of the most popular... <laughs> they really are. <laughs> no. <laughs> it, it'll never kill you. It can make you sick if you eat the mature plant, but, um, but it's a very popular pot herb in the southeastern United States, um, and they grow quite well here. Uh, it, it forms... This is one thing about ground covers, a misconception, is that they need to be a certain height. This forms a ground cover that's about five feet tall. It's a very dense clump, uh, so it keeps the ground covered. It's, it shades the ground. It doesn't allow weeds to grow up, and, and it's a beautiful plant. Zero maintenance. So if you have a, a patch of this growing in your garden, you just have to know how to harvest it. So don't be afraid of toxic plants. Rhubarb, the leaves are toxic, right? Um, yeah, you don't want to, like, uh, it, to have a patch of rhubarb in the garden, nobody blinks an eye at, but the leaves are toxic. So you just have to know how to use them and, and don't shy away from them. Um, this is cardoon, which is a very popular vegetable in Italy. It's, it's closely related to the globe artichoke. You can use the, um, uh, the, the unopened flower buds like artichoke hearts. And, uh, and then the leaf ribs are the main crop on this. They're quite thick and you, uh, you peel them and boil them. There's a, a national dish in Italy made from cardoon ribs where they, they boil them and then they batter and fry them and, uh, and they're delicious. Um, anise hyssop is one of my favorite salad greens. Uh, the leaves are sweet and taste like black licorice. Delicious. It also attracts a, a loads of pollinators. They're, uh, they're, it's, it's just a beautiful plant and uh, uh, I sell a lot of these because I offer people a lot of these, and, and people just love them, unless you don't like black licorice. Skirret is uh, a popular root vegetable that w in Europe in the 1500s, um, uh, and, and it goes back to Roman times. It was the Emperor Tiberius's favorite vegetable. Uh, they're related to uh, carrots and parsnips. Uh, you, uh, you dig up the roots. You can dig up just half a clump um, to leave, it, leave the rest in the ground as a perennial, and you clean them off and you get a bunch of carrot-like roots. They're, they're pretty thin. They're about the thickness of your finger, but they're quite long, maybe 8 to 10 inches long. You clean them off. You can eat them raw or roasted. Roasted, they're divine. They're a really excellent root vegetable. Very low maintenance. Alpine strawberries. Um, this is one of the only strawberries that doesn't spread by runners. They, they produce very small strawberries, but boy, do they pack a punch. And uh, they never make it into my kitchen. I, I'm always eating them in the garden. Um, but they, they make an excellent clumping ground cover as well. Um, this is bronze fennel. In fact, I have some, uh, some sweet fennel here. Uh, and this makes a wonderful salad green. This is closely related to the bulb fennel that you find at farmer's markets. Um, uh, but it doesn't form a bulb. 
Bulb fennel is biennial, so it lives only two years, whereas this is perennial. It lives from year to year. And, um, and the, the greens make a, a really delicious salad green, also tasting like anise or black licorice. And I use it in, in bulk ingredient, uh, as a bulk ingredient in my salads. Um, this is, um, this is uh, a native woodland perennial, S Solomon's seal. Um, it's, it's just a gorgeous plant. The shoots in the spring can be used like asparagus. So you can harvest about a third of your patch, uh, uh, and you let the rest of it go. Um, and, uh, and then you steam them for about five minutes. A little butter, a little salt and pepper, and they're, they're excellent. And it's, isn't that a beautiful plant? They're, they're lovely. I um, thought it was really Yeah, a lot of them. So, yeah, that, this is sea kale, a perennial vegetable that was popular in England 200 years ago. Um, you blanch them, so you put a pot over the spring shoots to exclude the light. They come up white. You cut them and, uh, and you steam them for five minutes. Another really good, sort of very mild cabbage-y flavor, but, uh, but excellent as a, as a vegetable. This is skirt, the, the root vegetable I was talking about. Let me just name off a few that you might have in your gardens. Uh, daylilies have wonderful edible flowers. Try your daylilies, honestly. They only live for a day. If you pick the flowers, it'll produce more flowers. And you can decorate. The only reason we don't eat more flowers is because they wilt so quickly. If you have them growing in your gardens, there's no reason not to decorate your salads with, uh, with flowers. And they're crunchy. They're quite substantial. The, the Chinese and, and, uh, and Taiwanese have acres under cultivation for food. They, they harvest the unopened flower buds and cook with them. They call them golden needles. This is an important crop in China. Uh, so we should be eating our daylilies here. Hostas. Who has, who has hostas in their garden? It's, it's just beyond the, uh, the season right now for hostas. The shoots, as they're coming up in the spring, they're tightly curled spears. You may still have some that are ready for harvest. You can cut them all off a mature plant, and it will grow more shoots, and you let those go. So those spears you take, and you cook them for six or seven minutes. Also, a, a very good vegetable. I, I blanch my hostas, so I also cover them with a, a pot uh, to exclude light. They're delicious. Sedum, uh, another common sedum is uh, Autumn Joy. Pick the leaves, eat them in your salads. I'll leave it at that for now. I could go on, but uh, thank you, thank you.